Okay, so um, to, what we're doing uh, in this class is the world according to Maimonides. Um, so I hope you're ready to uh, take a trip into a very different picture of the universe, um, but um, a very interesting one. Now, now um, on the one hand, the Rambam's worldview and the medieval worldview altogether will seem uh, very foreign. Um, fr from another perspective, though, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, the the medieval, the, the, the Aristotelian, Neoplatonic, scientific, philosophical worldview of the Rambam um, uh, is based on an attempt to make sense of the world in in in, a, in sort of a, in, a, in a way in keeping with the modern sense that the world functions according to uh, mechanistic, impersonal, fixed rules. So I think it's the case that it's the case that even though the worldview of the Rambam is so different from our worldview, if we try to imagine, if we try to forget everything we know or think we know about the scientific world and we just look at the stuff of our experience, then I think we'll find that if we think about the Maimonidean picture and try to picture it, it does jive more or less with our experience. So just to give the simplest uh, example, it's clear to the Rambam that the Earth, or, that the Sun or, or orbits around the Earth. Um, now we're trained not to think that way, but if I think about how the world looks to me when I look out the window, it does look like the Sun is orbiting around the, around the Earth. And so it's easy for me to imagine how the Rambam looked at it that way. Similarly, when we describe the four elements, fire, air, um, water, and earth, uh, we're trained to think that the world is made of atoms, not of four elements. However, it's easy to see the world as made of four elements, um, because we see fire, air, earth, and water all around, and they seem pretty basic. Um, sort of like, you know, maybe solid, liquid, um, um, gas, and energy, uh, as my friend... Uh, uh, has pointed out to me. Um, so, I would, I would, I would encourage you as you, as we, as you go through this material and as we consider it together, um, that you really try to take it seriously and think, well, can I look at the world like this? <clears throat> because, excuse me, because if you can do that, um, the whole thing becomes a lot more intuitive and interesting. And then when the Rambam interprets that world in the categories of Judaism, it's easy to see what he's doing and why he's doing it, and it makes it also easier in a way to um, to consider how we might make a similar religious interpretation of our world. Um, okay, so that's one thing I wanted to say before we get into the texts. Um, another point I want to make before we get into the text is that I can't possibly do justice to these texts and to the worldview that they reflect. Um, and that's because imagine the following thing. Imagine uh, that a thousand years from now, someone is trying to sum up the, the, uh, some aspect of the, of the Jewish philosophy of our day. And so they say, well, before we do that, I need to um, uh, fill you in on the picture of the world that they held way back then, a thousand years ago. Um, and so that person would then go on to say that, they, that the people of that generation believed things were made of atoms and believed the earth, you know, orbited around the sun, and they believed all sorts of stuff. Um, but they would be, if you, but, but what they would be trying to sum up is the sum total of science and philosophy, more or less, in our generation, which is a ridiculous tr thing to try to do. In other words, uh, the, 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 try to, to, the, the world of science, the world of what atoms are, the world of subatomic physics, the world of astronomy, is so complex that to try to sum that up a thousand years from now when everything we now think is considered antiquated is a very hard thing to do. So similarly, I'm going to try to point out and sum up aspects of the Rambam's worldview, but he was a real scientist. On any of these, any, of the, any one aspect of the worldview we're talking about, um, there's a tremendous amount of complexity, and there are scholars today that spend their lives and write many books about the intricacies and the details and the complexities of that worldview. So on some level of detail, 
what, when, what I'm trying to present here, I'm surely getting it wrong. Um, and I want to admit that at the beginning. Um, nonetheless, I think I have a grasp of, of the picture that's involved here, particularly vis-a-vis the kinds of questions that interest me um, and, and are at the center of the Rambam's, I think, uh, sort of existential take on religion and reality and how those two things interact. Um, so the goal is to look at things from that angle, but we need to know that we're dealing with very complex things that we can't possibly do them justice. Now, after all that introduction, let's begin. So we're going to begin um, with the with chapter two, which is on 35b. Now, it's a little tricky in these pages, right? You need to get used to them. Um, if you look at the tops of the pages, you'll see that it's, they're 35a and then 35b. And then on 35b, there are two lines, and underneath it, it says chapter two in Roman numerals. That's the chapter we're in. And then scroll down if you're on the computer or look down a little further, and you'll see halakha three. Each one of these little sections is called a halakha. Um, so we're in halakha three. And here it says, all that the holy God, blessed be he. Now, we haven't talked about God yet. We're going to talk about God next time. Right now, we're focusing just on the structure of reality, not where God is. We can't, you can't do that without talking about God a little bit, but that's not central for our purposes right now. So, however God fits into the picture, he created a universe, and then everything in the universe falls into three divisions. Right? These three divisions are pure form, form and matter that doesn't decompose, and form and matter that does decompose. Right? Okay. Now, before we can make sense of that, I want to give a little spiel on form and matter. Um, I th- one way to think about form and matter, again, these are very complex ideas with a long, long history in Greek and medieval philosophy, many different things you know, very, can be said and distinctions can be made. But when I try to think about it, I think about a Greek guy um, sitting sometime around 500 BCE in an island, one of the Greek islands, and he's looking out at the jungle, and this is what he sees. He looks out and he sees everything is constantly changing, and yet things stay the same. So in, in this Greek uh, forest, there's an acorn that grows into an oak tree because uh, he's being imagined by a person who grew up in New Jersey. Um, and that acorn is transformed from a little hard object into a tree. And then that tree grows up, decomposes, and turns to mud. So look at that. Everything turns into everything else. The hard acorn turns into the tree. The tree turns into this this large living body, which has both bark and wood and, and green leaves. The little hard object didn't have green leaves. And then that turns into dirt and mold. And then other stuff grows out of it. There are no rules here. Everything turns into everything else. Mush. But at the same time, that tree produces more little hard acorns. And they never turn into tigers. And they never turn into roses. They always turn into oaks. And oaks, while they vary one oak from another, also are largely the same. They have certain certain kinds of qualities. They have a shape of a leaf, and they have a, they have a quality of bark, a certain texture. Um, so something is also staying the same. There's an element out there in reality that's mush, that's constantly changing from one thing to another, that can't keep itself straight, that you just, you know, you mush it around and it turns from one thing into another. And at the same time, there are rules, there are certain patterns which repeat themselves again and again inside that muck. Now, this is, a, you know, clearly a very primitive presentation, but I think from here you can get to a pretty intuitive grasp of the ideas of form and matter. So our ancient Greek, in his uh, ancient Greek northeastern forest, um, says to himself, well, the muck, there's one, there are two elements here in this forest. One element is some kind of muck. 
that can take on patterns and lose patterns. It can look like an acorn, it can look like a tree, it can look like a leaf, and then it can look like mud. But there's another element here, which, while it always is embedded inside some kind of muck, it's, it's always the same. It, it, it comes and it goes. So the, the particular acorn disappears, but this, another acorn comes. So what's the part that comes back? What's the fixed part? The fixed part is a pattern or a form. And so is born one of the most crucial dichotomies in the history of, of human thought, or Western thought, at least, that, that the world can be divided into two very different elements. One of them is transient, changing, formless, mushy, gushy stuff, matter. That, and matter can be an acorn or mud or a tree or a rock or glass or water or our body or endless other things. And the other thing that exists in the world, which is not exactly a thing, but a principle, a pattern, is form. And form is eternal and spiritual, non-material. And matter can take on a form and then lose a form. And so the form, the acorn has a form, and then it develops into a full tree, eventually manifesting the fullness of an oak tree. And then the oak tree loses the form of an oak tree, and the matter of the oak tree takes on the form of mud. So this division is between material, definitionless, temporal, transient, changing stuff, and on the other hand, a spiritual, perfect, um, abstract, rational, why rational? Because it's the form which allows us to categorize things. I can say, this is the species of the, of, the, of the oak tree. And I can say, this is the species of tigers. But that's not because their matter is distinct. That's because the, the, the form which characterizes the species of tigers has a particular set of qualities. If I'm not mistaken, the word for form in Greek is eidos. Um, and species is related to the word eidos. That is to say... The, the aspect of tigers, which constantly returns ab throughout the generation and degeneration of each mushy, fleshy tiger, that's the form of tigerness, and that's a form. 